Hello. <laughs> hey, how are you? Hi. So good to see you. Thank you for doing this. No, I appreciate the having the opportunity. This is great. Oh my gosh, we're so we've been so excited. Like our whole staff was buzzing today about this. So everybody's <laughs> everybody's getting on to join, and we're really excited. So I'm um, the guinea I'm the guinea pig, aren't I? So that's yeah. telling me. <laughs> You're our first one, but that's what makes it special. We're excited. And we're just excited to share Dead Air with everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have, see the book come out, too. I've, yeah. I've uh, you know, invested a good, a good year writing it. And then, there, of course, there's the year, well, it had six, six months of all the editing and all that sort of thing. So it's yeah. really excited. It's a process. But now <laughs> we're about uh, two months away. Yep. The pub date, and so it's coming up. But do you want to give the people watching a quick intro about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Michael Bradley. Uh, I live in Delaware with my wife and our two dogs, Willie and Priya. Uh, I've been writing, uh, I guess, I guess it's 12 years now. Um, mostly all suspense and thriller. I really, that's really what I like to read. So I, you know, try to write what I what I enjoy the most as far as reading is concerned as well. So Dead Air is, of course, a suspense thriller book. Um, and I'm just, I'm really excited to see it come out at it, uh, June 9th. Can't get here fast enough. It really can't. <laughs> yeah. So. And... Yeah, we're very excited about the pub date. I see uh, one of our other fellow authors join, yep. Elizabeth Chatsworth. Um, I think we, we had a few other authors that said they were going to join. But um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about Dead Air before yeah. we read a few chapters? Absolutely. Yeah. If, if nobody's seen the cover, it's, yes. that's, that's it right there. Sure. Um, it's just I, I, uh, I really love the cover. Uh, it just speaks volumes about um, the book itself. But so Dead Air is a, a suspense novel that um, uh, takes place in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia, New Jersey area. It focuses on a, um, a woman named Caitlin Ash. Um, so Caitlin is got kind of an idyllic life at this point in her, in her life. You know, she's got, um, she's a top rated nighttime DJ in Philadelphia. Uh, she's um, got a lawyer boyfriend who absolutely adores her. She's got a group of friends at the radio station that she's really um, coming close to. Um, but Caitlin has a secret from her childhood that she's worked really hard all her life to hide, uh, really hard to kind of keep it away from everybody. Her friends don't know. Even her boyfriend doesn't know this secret. Uh, and she's worked really hard to kind of keep this buried deep, deep, deep in her past until a series of mysterious letters start showing up at the radio station, anonymous uh, there, the uh, letters are made up of uh, newspaper clippings and magazine clippings, and they're all alluding to the fact that somebody else knows her secret, um, which then I won't give too much away about the story, uh, but murder and mayhem ensue. So um, as she tries to figure out what ha what's going on and who's doing this and who's watching you know, who's stalking her, you could say, um, who knows the, the secret that she's got um, hidden deep, deep and down. Um, there's another character, uh, the Detective Rodney Shapiro, who is obviously the police detective who gets assigned to investigate the letters. Um, so he becomes involved as well. He's uh, got his own little uh, past that he's got to deal with as he's doing the investigation as well. And, and it all just keeps building up and building up to this uh, terrifying uh, finale at this mysterious place called The Shallows. I'm not going to go too much into what The Shallows is because I, I want to hold some stuff back so people yeah. can figure it out. But, um, you know, I'm really excited. Uh, you know, it took a long time to write this book, but um, I'm really excited to see it come out uh, in June. So, yeah, we definitely want to ask some questions later on about okay. setting and about that editorial process, but first, maybe we can hear some some of the few, first few chapters. Yeah, sure. I'm going to read the first two chapters of the book. Yeah. Um, okay. Excuse me while I take a sip of my tea. Oh, yeah. you got to get the voice ready. you got to keep the throat going. Yeah. Um, so this is the first two chapters of um, Dead Air, and I, I will point out that, um, so the first chapter, you get introduced to Caitlin, 
The second chapter comes across, it, until you read the whole book, the second chapter seems a little odd because it's actually from the point of view of the actual person who's stalking Caitlin. So it may sound a little odd, but um, when you read it all in context with the whole rest of the book, it all makes a lot of sense. So Yeah, we get to see, <clears throat> you get inside the head of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me go ahead and start reading. So this is chapter one of Dead Air, uh, the book that's coming out June 9th. She'd been found out. There was no other explanation. On any other night, Caitlin Ash would relish the breathtaking view of the Philadelphia cityscape, the twinkle of the white street lights, red, yellow, and green traffic lights, and the white and red hues from car lights on the streets below looked like a swirling star field, constantly changing as if at the whim of a fickle god. From the 20th, 20th floor broadcast studio, we could, she could look down upon the center, center city, could see as far as the Walt Whitman Bridge and across the Delaware River to the distant lights of Camden, New Jersey. Yes, every other night, this view was mesmerizing, but not tonight. Tonight, Caitlin Ash trembled at the thought that someone out there knew her, knew her secret, and was making damn sure she didn't forget it. The past had come a step closer each time another letter arrived. Her fingers tightened their grasp on the latest, a crumpled paper creased with crisscross lines and folds. It was a cliché. The mysterious correspondences consisted of letters and phrases torn from newspapers and magazines, crudely pasted onto plain paper. Always the same message, always the same signature. Behind her, music played softly. She turned away from the window and moved around the L-shaped counter in the middle of the room to slide onto a tall stool behind the control console. Caitlin leaned forward, glancing at the needles on the VU meters that jumped and pulsed to the music's beat. She touched one of the 10 slider controls and adjusted the volume to remove some mild distortion. Caitlin watched the on-screen clock count down at the end of the current song. 15 seconds to go. She slid the headphones over her ears and drew the broadcast microphone to her mouth. She tapped the green button on the console and pushed the left slider up. Caitlin leaned into the microphone. Taking things back to 2005 with Lifehouse on WPLX, that was you and me going out to Jamie from Kristen Tiffany from Steve, and to Tommy, Jackie still loves you. She glanced again at the clock in the upper corner of the computer screen. It's 10 past 10. I'm Caitlin Ash with Love Songs at 10. 885-555-WPLX is the number to get your dedication in tonight. I got Adele lined up as well as John Legend on the way next. Her fingers darted over the control console, tapping the buttons and moving sliders. Caitlin took the headphones off. As a, commercial, as a commercial for Ambrosia, her favorite seafood restaurant in downtown Philadelphia played, she stared at the crinkled letter that rested beside the console. She read it once again beneath the dim studio lights. Her eyes focused on the name at the bottom, The Shallows. She shivered. Who knew? And how much did they know? Caitlin slipped a green Bic lighter from her pocket and lit the edge of the letter and pinched, pinched the corner as the flame swept up the paper. She'd stolen the lighter from Kevin O'Neill's desk. She knew the midday DJ would never miss it. He had half a dozen more where that one came from. She dropped the paper into the empty wastebasket and watched the flame dwindle into nothingness, leaving behind blackened flakes. A faint trace of smoke hung in the air, then dissipated quickly. She wrung her hands and sighed. There'd be another one in her station mailbox tomorrow, just like the four others that she'd received each day this week. She was certain of it. The flash of green lights caught her eye, and she looked down at the studio telephone. All four lines were lit up. She hesitated for a moment, then tapped the first line. WPLX, do you have a dedication? Yeah, I'd like to dedicate my weekend to kissing your body from head to toe. The smoky voice echoed through the darkened studio. Caitlin laughed and felt her face become warm with embarrassment. Brad, how goes it, babe? Having a good night? She forced a smile, trying to sound upbeat, just as she'd learned in her voiceover coaching. It's not too bad. But what's wrong? She cursed under her breath. She never could hide things from Brad. I got another letter today. The line was silent for a moment. Same message? She glanced at the computer and then back at the phone. Yeah, exactly the same. You should call the police. It was the same suggestion he'd made a month ago when the letters started arriving on a weekly basis. With this week's sudden volley of letters, he had taken to repeating his advice nightly. 
Caitlin had shrugged it off as just some crank. You get those in this business, she had said. Still, no idea who's sending these letters or what they're about? She hesitated for a second before replying. No idea, she lied. You need to tell someone, if not the police, at least tell Scott. Caitlin frowned at his remark. The last thing she wanted to do was tell her program director, Scott McKay, about the letters. His overly protective nature would mean police involvement for certain. I can't tell Scott. He'd place an armed guard on the studio door. Brad laughed. Would that be so bad? There's no point. It's probably some infatuated teenager. She knew how ridiculous the words sounded, even as they escaped her lips. No teenage listener would know about the shallows. Do me a favor. Watch yourself tonight when you go home. The concern in his voice was evident. If she asked, he'd be there in a moment to escort her home. But she couldn't do that to him, not without re revealing something she'd worked so hard to bury in her own past. Caitlin said, I will, promise. How's the rest of the night going? It's been crazy. Lots of lovers out there tonight. I can't even get them all in. Just not enough time. I wouldn't expect any less from the most listened to night show in Philly. With a glance at the computer screen, Caitlin noted where she was in the commercial break and then turned back toward the phone. What are you up to, sweetie? Working on, working my way through a couple briefs. I gotta have these ready for a review by tomorrow. Sounds like a late night, she said. He sighed, probably. Caitlin sensed the fatigue and frustration in his voice. She knew nothing about corporate law other than, the Bra other than what Brad had told her. The reams of paperwork and the bewilder bewildering legalese seemed boring and unappealing. She knew he had a lot on his plate and hated to see him work as hard as he did. A mischievous smile crossed her lips. If you want, I could slip over later tonight and help you with your briefs. Brad chuckled. Brad's chuckle echoed through the studio. That'd be nice, really nice. She leaned closer to the speakerphone and spoke almost in a whisper. You know you want to. She added a central emphasis to each word. It'll make you feel good. That's not fair, he paused, then asked. Can I take a rain check? I need to get these done. Her fingers clicked on the microphone, and out of the commercial break, she gave a quick weather forecast before starting the next song. Then she turned off the microphone and turned back to the phone. Are we still on for lunch tomorrow? Absolutely. Just you and me in a dark corner of Tuscanas. Looking down at the phone, she noticed that the other three lines were still flashing. I've got to go, sweetie. Love you. Love you, too. Talk to you later. When he'd hung up, Caitlin turned to face the window and gazed out across the cityscape. The lights below seemed brighter somehow, a little more stunning than before. She sighed with deep satisfaction. There was something about Brad's voice that always relaxed her and quelled her fears. He was trusting, gentle, and loving. She was lucky to have him. For four weeks, he'd accepted her word that she knew nothing about the shallows or why anyone would send her these letters. Brad may have suspected that she was lying, but he never pushed her. It would all come out eventually. She couldn't go on being dishonest indefinitely. She just needed time, time to figure out how to explain that she wasn't who she pretended to be. Caitlin turned to the computer to check the playlist. Her gaze froze and she frowned. Ario Speedwagon was coming up on the list. Her sh shoulders gave a momentary shudder. She loved the band as long as she could remember. While her high school friends were listening to the likes of Justin Timberlake and Christine Aguilera, Caitlin had dug back a couple decades and discovered Ario Speedwagon. She loved their songs, but this particular one held a spell over her. Its impact had diminished over the years. She'd almost reached the point of being able to play it as opposed to deleting it from the playlist whenever it showed up. That is until recently. It only evoked the briefest of memories. She would twinge at the brief reminder and use the song's deletion as a way to purge herself of the past. That, however, was then. The arrival of letters had changed everything. Now the sheer appearance of the song frightened Caitlin, reminding her that her past was catching up. Some secrets couldn't stay hidden forever. She had hoped the anniversary would pass unnoticed again this year, but with only three weeks to go until that date, someone was making sure that she remembered every detail. She jabbed the delete key and the sense of release washed over her as the song vanished from the screen. Breathing slow and deep, she allowed her uneasiness to subside. Then she leaned toward the microphone and clicked the next blinking line. WPLX, do you have a dedication? 
When the elevator door opened, Caitlin stepped out into the building's attached parking garage. An hour's worth of commercial voiceover work had been waiting for her when she went off the air at midnight. It took longer than usual for her to plow through it. She was too distracted, making too many mistakes, leading to far more retakes than was her norm. On her way out, she'd stop at the, by the studio to tell Justin Case, the overnight personality, that he, she was leaving. They talked for another hour. Between station IDs and weather forecasts, Justin showed her pictures of his latest girlfriend, his third this year, and explained how they met. Caitlin suggested a couple places he could take her, Longwood Garden, the art museum. Justin shrugged them off, saying the girl was, quote, more into unusual and bizarre, end quote. Caitlin rolled her eyes and laughed. Then try the Muter Museum. That should be bizarre enough for her. Then she said her farewells and left, imagining Justin and his new girlfriend finding romance amidst the anatomically, anatomically correct wax figures, glass cases filled with pathological specimens, and ancient medical equipment fit for a steampunk horror movie. Pausing by the elevator doors for a moment, she scanned the empty parking lot, just as she'd done every night for the past few, four weeks. The night air was crisp on her face and she caught the faint whiff of the city. It was a mix of odors almost unique to Philadelphia, bitter and often pungent. She shivered in the chilled air and an unwanted memory flashed through her mind. Back then, on that fateful night, the air had been brisk as well. She didn't see anyone around but couldn't shake the sense that she was being watched. For a while, she had chalked it up to the paranoia induced by the letters, but their increased recurrence left her more anxious every day. Her fingers gripped a little more tightly on the paper, pepper spray canister on her chain. Caitlin gave the parking garage one more inspection. No one was in sight and no sound came other than the hum of the nearby flickering fluorescent lights. She strode towards her motorcycle. Her boot heels echoed throughout the empty garage. The chrome handlebars and exhaust pipes of the Harley Davidson shone in the overhead lights. She smiled as her eyes glanced over the motorcycle's candy apple red fuel tank and fenders. She had always wanted a Harley, even as a child, but a bike was a luxury that had eluded her until last year. When she topped the Arbitron ratings as the highest rated nighttime air personality in Philadelphia, Caitlin is celebrated by fulfilling her childhood dream. The promise of more spring-like temperatures for April was the catalyst she'd been waiting for to bring the motorcycle out of winter storage. Caitlin changed the oil and washed and waxed it the previous weekend. Three days into the new week, she was re-experiencing joy of riding she had longed for throughout the winter. She straddled the black leather seat and zipped up her tan leather jacket. As the motorcycle rumbled to life, Caitlin raced the throttle a few times just to hear the engine's roar echo through the deserted parking garage. She got a rush, rush every time from the engine vibrations racing through the handlebars up her arms. She smiled and for a moment forgot about the letters. Then she slid her, a black helmet over her head and drew the visor down over her eyes. Her foot pulled the kickstand up and revving the engine one more time, Caitlin sped down the ramp onto the garage and into the dark streets of Philadelphia. Ooh. We're getting a lot of activity in the comments of people <laughs> catching, on, catching on to all the suspense. Oh, good. Cool. Of the buildup of the letters. So here's chapter two. Okay. So bit, this is a bit shorter. Um, but this gives you a chance you, to dig in a little deeper. And you prefaced for anybody who joined in later that um, it's from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this is actually, um, this was, it was actually quite uh, interesting to write because I switched, I kept switching between what's called third party, a third person point of view mm -hmm. to first person yeah. when I was dealing with the stalker um, who's following Caitlin. So this is actually from that person's perspective. Okay. So this is chapter two. She looks nervous tonight, a bit more pensive than usual. Standing in the elevator's threshold, she's keeping the doors open, almost afraid to move out into the parking garage. Her reaction amuses me. No, amusing isn't the word. Ecstatic. Yes, that's the word. I'm ecstatic over the reaction my letters are having on her. Ecstatic to the point of being rapturous. Rapturous? Yes, I like that. She's kept me waiting tonight longer than usual. What time is it? After 2 a.m.? Shit, I've been here for five hours. Far too much time to spend in this godforsaken city. I've grown to hate it over the years. The lights, the noise, the smells. I hate it all. Too much fractured memories and an overburden of lingering grief. I must have liked it at one time. After all, I grew up in its shadow. 
This city litters my childhood memories like newspapers blowing in the wind. Trips over the river to see Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell, sitting on a bench for a picture of the smelly old man dressed like Ben Franklin, Springsteen concerts at the old Spectrum, all memories that should bring a warmth to my heart and soul, but I feel nothing but anger and hate. She's tainted everything. My memories, the city, my life, everything. God, I need a cigarette. I don't dare light up. She might see the flare of the match. Filthy habit. Not sure why I started smoking. It was something to do these past few months while I waited for her to emerge each night. There's a growing pile of discarded butts by my feet. Doesn't anyone clean up around here? She didn't play the song again. I listened all night and nothing. Why can't she take a hint? I doubted she forgot. I doubt she's forgotten. I just wanted to play it once, just once. That's all I wanted when this all began, to hear the song and know she remembers. Why won't she ever play it? How many months have I stood here watching her, night in and night out? You'd think I'd be used to it by now, but I'm still apprehensive, still jittery. Would she recognize me if she saw me? It's only been 13 years, but I've changed so much in that time. Dropped a shitload of weight, cut off most of my hair. I'm not a goddamn kid anymore. Will she know me when we finally meet? She's on the move, crossing the garage to the bike of hers. Audacious piece of crap. Why would she ever want one of those things? Jesse would never have gone for a biker bitch. The damn, thing, the damn thing is loud, especially in the parking garage. Its roar pierces my ears. She'll be leaving momentarily. And if I want to follow her, I need to get back to the car two levels above. But I don't dare move. She mustn't see me. Not yet. Not until everything is in place. It'll be a reunion she won't forget until the day she dies. At this hour, she'll be only be going to one of two places. Her apartment or his apartment. I can catch up to her either way. The breath I've been holding escapes. I'm still trembling. I need a smoke. There's nothing like that first drag off of a freshly lit cigarette. I love the way it tickles my throat. God, I need this. It's soothing and steadies my nerves. A chill hangs in the air like the night Jesse died. Was it this cold back then, or did it just seem like that? I can't remember the details as clearly anymore. Time heals all wounds, they say, but that's such a lie. The concrete is cold beneath my feet, as cold as my heart, as cold as she will be when I'm done. Just a couple more weeks, and then it'll be time for Laura Hobson to return to the shallows. Ah, it's so good. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna Thank you. I'm trying to clap, but I can't. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Everyone's got chills in the comments. <laughs> okay, awesome. I'd love to know, Helga, your editor commented about how this voice is so different, which it, I mean, it's a different point of view, but kind of what was the decision making for you in choosing to show <clears throat> the point of view of the stalker? So uh, when I originally finished the first draft, there was no point of view for the stalker. And it just kind of felt like it was missing something. You know, when I was, when I was going back and I was rereading it, um, you know, I kind of felt like there, there, were, there were things that I wanted to, to reveal that I really couldn't reveal from Caitlin's point of view, um, not without giving too much away. Yeah. Um, so it just seemed appropriate to add an, uh, an additional point of view. Um, and originally I had thought about just doing it as another third person point of view. But as I started to write it, I started to realize that I can't make this person sound as crazy as they are or how or, or insane as they are in um, the third person. So I had to get I felt like I had to get deeper and deeper into um, this person's head. And the only way to do that was to write it in that first person. Um, and then also, um, you know, I, I wanted to make it present tense as well so that you, it doesn't, doesn't give away anything about the ending as well. Yeah. I love how you get the beginning of the second chapter is this is that point of view of the end of the first. And so you realize instantly like, oh, this is the person that's watching her. Like this yeah. is the person that's stalking her. And it's, I love that that's the second chapter because you can get right into it. Like, I love that. Um, also, anyone in the, anyone watching, if you have any questions, make sure to shoot them in the um, comments and we'll make sure to ask them. But, um, and I also love, I feel like from Caitlin, when you see it third person, you see kind of her struggle and trauma from the outside. 
but then like you said you reveal so much more from being inside the mind um, mm. the stalker yeah I, more to that experience yeah with 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 caitlin um i really kind of felt like it had to be third person um because i'm a guy and i was you know to write a first person uh female character at, at length like this um, just didn't seem right because I just really didn't think I could do do it justice. Um, so that's why I kind of thought, okay, let me let me focus on Caitlin from the third person because then I can get more of the descriptions as well into it as well and some of the other stuff that goes on. Uh, but I'm still getting into her head and and giving a view of you know who she is and what she's struggling with. Yeah, definitely. Um, we had a few questions that. Um we had asked beforehand, but some of our staff wanted to know why Philadelphia and why you picked that setting and what <laughs> so the significance is there. Part of the reason that I chose Philadelphia. Um, so one of the things that inspired this book was in rural New Jersey, there's a pond that's that I, that off the interstate that I drive, I've driven by over and over and over again as a, cause I grew up in, New, in Southern New Jersey. So I've seen this pond again and again and again all my life. And a few years ago, I, I, I was driving past on a regular basis and I started to think, you know, that pond, is, it's, it's a beautiful pond. Uh, but I started to wonder what could it hide? Um, you know, so that kind of was in my head. I'm like, okay, you know, uh, that started to roll around in my head for a few years while I just kind of thought about it. Um, and it didn't seem right to place this any place other than where the pond, uh, roughly is. Um, I try to, when I, when I write, I try to incorporate as many real settings into the books as I possibly can without obviously, you know, saying things negative about businesses or things like that. I'll change those names, but like the streets in Philadelphia are, are real streets, um, there's some stuff that takes place over in Southern New Jersey, um, in a fictional version of this pond, um, that are all, that's, that has, you know, the right street names and everything. So I try to add that realism. So it didn't really feel right to go anywhere other than Philadelphia for this. Yeah. Um, someone also asked why a Harley, why is that special to Caitlin Ash's character? <laughs> um, to be honest, I don't know. Yeah, I think it kind of gives her an edge. You know, it, it was one of those. It was one of those choices. It was like, okay, I want to. I wanted to ride a motorcycle, and and I, you know, thought about the different motorcycle brands that are out there, and she, I couldn't picture her riding like a one of those uh, Kawasaki things where you lean way over the handlebars, um, and I want. So I wanted her to ride something old school, and um, Harley was the first one that came to mind. So, you know, I, I grabbed that as the, the motor, the, my go-to motorcycle for this. Yeah. Um, Helga commented that it's unusual to feel closer to the stalker than to the victim. I feel like that plays up what we were saying earlier about how you, you get a little more honesty from the stalker and you, you know less from the main character. And it almost was that intended to kind of put like distrust against Caitlin, like that you can't you don't know if you can trust your main character because you don't know what secret she has. Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I want it, you know, like I try, I'm trying to keep, I tried to keep as much of the secret hidden as far into the book as I possibly can. I mean, there's a, there is a point, I think about halfway through the book where like, for instance, about a third of the way through the book, you learn a little bit about her secret. Um, and about, I don't know, two thirds of the way through the book, you learn a lot more, mm -hmm. but there's, there's still this one last piece of it that you don't learn, uh, learn about until the very end. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it was, it really just came down to, I wanted to be able to expose certain aspects, um, certain memories, certain things that I really couldn't do from through Caitlin and I needed to have somebody else there. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of why I. Did you, you know, have that ending in mind 
from the beginning or did it kind of start to take shape as you wrote? No, I had that ending in mind. Okay. So when I started writing this, um, when I started writing this, the, the things that I had in mind was I had the opening scene in mind and I had the final scene. Uh, well, when, I'm, when I say final scene, um, I, I, I mean the final climax. You okay. know, there's, a, there's, yeah. a chap there's like two chapters after the, the climax where there's kind of some, some you know, uh, wrap up stuff. Yeah. But um, when I started writing this, I had that f the, the climax in mind and I had the opening scene in mind and then I had to fill in the blanks from there. Oh, well, that's incredible because that's like, that's the heart of the book. I feel like when you know when everything's revealed, it's what you're waiting for the whole time. The hard part is getting from the beginning to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, filling in all the other aspects. Yeah. Was there any, was that where, did you find most of your editing was kind of living in that space between? Or what was that editorial process like for you with CamCat? Um, so I, so first of all, Helga was awesome to work with. I, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, and, um, you know, I found that through the editing process, uh, you know, I had I had the, the plot put together uh, through the editing process. There was some fine tuning that I think made this much better. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of, OK, well, you know, this is this piece of it is a little weak. So we need to strengthen this this subplot, um, this sub this element of the plot is a little too overdone. We need to pull that back a little bit. Um, which, you know, was awesome. It, we, the whole editing process was f fantastic because it, it really gave me an opportunity to, to really tighten up the characters, tighten up the plot, um, and really kind of bring this all together. Yeah. She, Helga wants to know how long did it take for you to write the book? It took me about a year. Okay. It took me about a year. Um, I finished it. Uh, when did I finish it? I think I finished it sometime in 2000. I think I finished it like right at the beginning of 2019, I believe. Um, and that, you know, that was the second draft, and, you know, to be honest, you can't really say it was finished until it's actually published. Right. Um, Cause you know, through the editing process, there was all kinds of rewrites and stuff that had mm -hmm. to go on as well. So technically it wasn't really, isn't really finished until June, June 9th, 2020. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> adds to the process um grace wanted to know if there are any thriller authors that inspired this book and just to know about some of the inspiration behind the book so um one of the thriller writers that i really like um who um is lisa unger and um she she does she, I, she had a book that i read um called um crazy love you that had the first person, very strong first person point of view. And that kind of helped me to decide to try writing the, um, the, uh, the stalker in the first person, because I, I don't particularly like to write in first person. I much prefer third person. Um, but after reading uh, Crazy Love You, which is all in first person, um, it just made, it just really inspired me to go ahead and write to try writing the first person character. Yeah. Um, and from a perspective of inspiration for the book, there were two, one was the pond. Um, and the other is an REO Speedwagon song. Uh, I keep, uh, called can't fight this feeling. Um, that was the other, the other thing that inspired it because I grew up in that era when that song was popular and we used to dance to it at high school dances and stuff like that. Um, so I'm probably going to really tick off a lot of 80s people when I say that I don't think it's I don't think Can't Fight This Feeling is really a love song. I really kind of think it's a song about a stalker, because when you listen to the lyrics, you know, it's like it's like I'm following you everywhere, girl. I'm watching you from, you know, all the time. Um, I'll come crashing through your door. So now we go from stalking to breaking and entering. Um, so, I, you know, when I started to think about it, wow, this is song's really kind of about a stalker. Um, those that in the pond slowly started to merge together. Um, it. And it went yeah. from there. Okay. So <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, Elizabeth has a question. Um, mm -hmm. Has writing this book changed you? Uh, um, 
I think it's helped me to, I think if anything, this, the book, writing the book has helped me be a better writer more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, um, I tried out some new things that I've never done before. Um, Oh, I just saw somebody says, ha I've never thought of that song like that before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Susan said, I'll never hear the song the same way. <laughs> <laughs> so I've just ruined it for everybody. Yeah, um, it. Um, so it, um, I mean, it, it, if anything else, it made me become a better writer because I really had, I had to dig really deep to do the first person point of view. Um, I had to dig deep to do some of the other stuff that I've, that I did in the in the writing of this as well. Um, I spent a lot more time um, researching, you know, locations than I did than I have with anything else that I've written. So, um, has it changed me? You know, made me a better person or something like that? Probably not. Um, but it definitely, especially in the editing process, really helped me identify things that I needed to change in my writing to improve for the next book. That's amazing. Um, could you speak a little more about the research that you just mentioned there? Like what kind of research went in? For this book? So, so a big thing for me was uh, making sure that the locations, uh, like I said, I try to try to put in as much realism as I can. Yes. So there's, there's all, there's some, uh, some locations that I, you know, made a point of visiting to make sure I got it right. Um, I spent quite a bit of time driving past that pond uh, to, uh, yeah, it was, it was at the time I didn't know who owned it. So I didn't want to just like drive into their driveway and drive out to the pond. It's part of this big farm. Um, turns out now that I found out that it actually is owned by somebody I went to high school with. So, uh, well, <laughs> so actually a really scary I, book about your pond. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. So, uh, but you know, it was, it was a matter of trying to make sure that I got accuracy in, in the, the, um, the different things that I did, such as, you know, making sure that the, the locations that I was writing about were accurate, making sure that I was ensure that Philadelphia, um, since I live in this area, that I wanted to make sure that that was as accurate as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another fun question from Helga. She says, without giving anything away, what is the most <laughs> redeeming quality of your antagonist? Ah, uh, so okay, I can't think how to say this without giving something away. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say the most redeeming part of my antagonist is my antagonist's love of family. And I really can't say much more than that. <laughs> That's good. It's good. It's a good hook. It's good intrigue. Um, Susan in the comments wants to know, is this a standalone book or part of a series? Don't answer if there are spoilers, <laughs> is what she says. As of right now, it is strictly a standalone. Um, I don't necessarily know if there's anything that I can <laughs> do with Caitlin and Rodney after the fact, but yeah. uh, you never know. Mm -hmm. You never know. Maybe something, some idea will come up. Yeah. Um, and I may, you know, go from there later on. So, yeah. Um, do you feel like Rodney's character was essential in kind of helping bring things out of Caitlin? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, I, I really, when I, when I, when I wrote this, um, I like to have multiple points of view in the stuff that I write because I feel like it gives fresh perspective. If I had written everything from Caitlin's point of view, um, I think it would have, um, at some point people would have just gotten tired of hearing from her yeah rodney gives get rodney comes in as the um the vo almost like the voice of the reader questioning he's the detective, right? yeah he's the detective and he comes in almost as almost as if he's the the voice of the reader um asking the questions like what is this that, what is she hiding you know why is she so you know nervous about telling you things and you know stuff like that so he kind of comes in as that um uh, voice outside of the events, but at the same time, he also gives a point of view of of events that uh, that, that that Caitlin really probably can't. Like, what's going on? What's going on outside of Caitlin's world? 
you know, what is, what's he doing outside of Caitlin's world um, to try to figure out what's going on and how are these certain discoveries? You know, there are certain things that are discovered throughout the book um, that really Rodney is the only person that's going to be able to discover those. Mm -hmm. And he is, you know, is able to reveal that to the reader. Otherwise the reader is just kind of going along, listening to Caitlin talk about how she doesn't want to talk about what her secret is. Yeah. And you can look at the other characters in a way that Caitlin can't then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I love that. Anyone else in the comments have some questions? Elizabeth says she loves multiple POV. So do I. <laughs> so do we all. <laughs> I, I, I much prefer it. I much prefer it because I think it gives a nice, a nice pers different perspective throughout the books. You're not listening to the same voice yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, earlier, someone had asked where they can buy it. And so I just wanted to note um, the link in our bio will take you to our website. And the main <clears throat> page will have several buy links for Dead Air for pre-order and so many places you can buy it. where <laughs> It's very accessible. Um, Jen asked the published date is um, June um, 9th. <laughs> Had to make sure June 9th of this summer. So yeah. Yep. Dana wants to know what your fa what's your fave POV POV book. I fave POV book. I have to go back to the Lisa Unger book, The Crazy Love You, because uh, not only was it the f a first person, but it was an incredibly unreliable narrator. Mm. And it was just a roller coaster read the whole time. The whole time. It was just one big roller coaster. Uh, and then you get to the end and it's the unreliable narrators revealed. And you're like, you're like, oh my gosh, I, I, <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it, it leaves you shocked. Do you feel like the readers can trust Caitlin when reading Dead Air? No, no. Because she's she's got she's got a secret and yeah. she's going to do what she can to keep it. Um, so, so you can't trust her. Yeah. Um, Sue would like to know, as an author, what kind of things are you doing to promote your book? Authors want good ideas. Uh, so I do a lot of social media stuff. I've got, um, you know, I run some I run ads on Facebook. I've got stuff going on on Book, book Bub. Uh, as well. Um, I try to interact with people on Twitter uh, and Facebook. Uh, I'll be honest, Instagram is kind of new for me. So mm -hmm. uh, so if you, you look on Instagram, you see that I've got four pictures. That's because <laughs> I've never really used it before. I'm yeah. mainly a Twitter and Facebook person. So, um, yeah. But, you know, I do that and I, and I like to go to, um, I really like to go to festivals, book festivals and stuff like that because, um it gives me a chance to meet the people, uh, talk to people. Um, you know, I liked one of the things that I've done that, that I really enjoy is you know, I did a uh, festival a couple of years ago with uh, another writer and we had rolled out this, had this roll of butcher paper and rolled it out on the table and asked everybody that came to the table to write down who their favorite villain was. Um, and it was interesting to see all these different names showing up all, all across the paper. Uh, but that, that's the kind of thing I like that interaction. I like the opportunity to meet the people. So when I do stuff, when I, you know, when I do stuff at, at, you know, at book festivals, it's really great to meet people. Um, I'm, if, as long as it's not canceled, I'll actually be at Thriller Fest this year up in New York City as well. Um, so I'm involved in, in the, the international thriller writers. So I'm looking forward to, to going there, hopefully, if nothing yeah, gets canceled. Yeah, hopefully that's still <laughs> going yeah. on and that you can be found there and, you know, sign some books. And that would be amazing. Well, um, if there are no more questions, let me see if we have any last one to wrap it up with. <clears throat> um, how about uh, last question, if no one else in the comments has one. Who is your favorite literary bad guy? Um, um, wow. There's so many. I, I think I'm going to have to say, um, and, and you know, and it's funny because this person is not a, uh, this is not a bad guy that shows up much. Um, but I'm going to say Professor Moriarty from Sherlock Holmes. Ooh. Not, not, you know, not so much about because of the bad stuff that he does, but it's, it's his, his meaner demeanor, um, his, um, the way he's got control over 
his organization. You know, he's a much, he's a much bigger, he's not just your common criminal. He's this mm -hmm. mastermind who, who, as Holmes explains, sits at the center of a big web and runs everything from, from all that web. Um, so I think he's probably the, the big one for me. Did he inspire um, your villain at all? Mm, as far as no, villain? no, if, not if really. Cause, has... cause, cause really my villain, the villain doesn't have control. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. No, no, I, I, he didn't inspire. Um, I think he's too, uh, too, on, too, too, he's on a grand scale and I don't, I don't, don't see how he could have possibly been an influ uh, inspiration yeah. for mine. So. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Well, Dead Air is out June 9th, and pre-order is up now on our website, so I urge everyone to go click that. And also, we have an announcement that um, we're going to be doing a Dead Air book club on Facebook, mm -hmm. and if you head to our Facebook page, there is a sign-up form on the most recent post. You can share your info, and we'll be reading that book together and you'll get to interact a little bit with Michael, you know, in the process. And so it'll be great, but um, we really appreciate you coming and spending time and sharing your book with people to be able to listen on our Instagram. And it's exciting to kind of have one-on-one -on -one with the author, you know? Great. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this is awesome. Yeah. There will be more. <laughs> All right. And any other things to share? I think that's all. Pre-order is on our, at the link in our bio, which is most important so we can all read it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Michael. We appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank you. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye.